Hi, everyone. Just before we get going, I want to remind you that everything we talk about and discuss should not be considered as investment advice. The purpose of what we talk about on Catherine Murray in Media and Markets on YouTube, as well as Catherine Murray in Conversation With on my podcast, should be viewed as informational and entertainment purposes only. Please definitely do your own research, your own homework, and definitely consult an investment professional before making any investment decisions. And also to note, some of us might hold positions in some of the stocks uh, that we discuss. Um, Jim, great to be able to catch up with you. Um, and, you know, I think for years and years now, you and I've been talking and I love getting your views. Um, it, it's often provocative, it's thoughtful, it's methodical, it's thinking, and we're trying to kind of figure out where we're at right now and where we're going. Um, that's really what's kind of key to success and successes. So um, thanks. Uh, great to see you and speak with you. Thanks for having me, Catherine. All right, so let you, you know, you've written a lot uh, for your clients. Um, so there's actually quite a bit to get through. And I think that they're all really important topics to discuss because it is what is being debated right now. Um, so, you know, the outlook for the S&P 500, I, I know you've talked a lot about, but I think we kind of need to start top down in terms of how you're viewing the world right now. And the biggest debate has been around inflation and whether or not we are seeing inflation or disinflation and, and why it is so important to get this call right. So like, I'm just going to backtrack. So long-term, medium and long-term, we think that we're in a period between that looks a lot like 1945 to 1951. That's long-term, but short-term coming out of the V-shaped recovery, uh, from COVID, we really think that 2009 and 2010 provides us a very interesting roadmap. And if you remember coming out of 2009 and 2010, when Mr. Bernanke started talking about tapering, the market pivoted very, very quickly from early cycle areas in the market. So that would be commodities, interest sensitive, that would be banks, that would be companies that were uh, that benefited from an accelerating economy and it rapidly pivoted into mid-cycle or long duration assets, which were technology and long dated bonds. And we think that where we are right now is kind of in the middle. We, we were expecting to see a slowdown. And we think that right now that the bond market is telling us a 10 year bond, the yield peaked at the end of March Transports have been lagging, small caps have been lagging, and value has started to lag. So we think the market is starting to get it position itself for, for tapering, which would mean a drawdown. We don't know how long that would be. Maybe, you know, I, I say to our clients, it really depends on how much Amazon and the large mega cap tech hold us in, but underneath you're seeing a massive correction. So what we need to see is really tapering, and once that happens, we would expect that to last nine to 12 months. We don't think they can raise interest rates, right? Um, and so really it comes down to Catherine, mm -hmm. are they serious about this build back better, green inclusive economy? We have heard in my, in my personal professional career, the, there was a regime change when President Clinton got in nothing happened. There was a, even a bigger regime change when, when President Obama got in. And really he did some things with healthcare, but he didn't do the big things that needed to get done. Are we going to see- the in, in terms of green, in terms of green. In terms of green. And, yeah. and if we get that, then we're in a period that's akin to the first decade of this millennial where you take out the urbanization of China and you put in build back better green and you have a, a, a period of intermediate trade or a longer view where value commodities, um, you know, cyclicals that are benefit the building out of the green economy. So are also important contributors to outperformance as is the digitization. And I think what is happening now was 
Mr. Powell and the policymakers were very proactive in last March to, to do what they needed to do, invoking Section 13. Uh, point three of the Federal Reserve Act, right? To hit, as Paul Tudor Jones says, use the atomic bomb or the neutron bomb of capital to save the global economy. Um, but do we go back to that, to, to the reactive policymaking that we had under Ben Bernanke, where we had QE1, QE2, QE3, QE4? If we have that, then we're going to have these periods of times of inflation, and then there's going to be deflation, inflation, deflation. Uh -huh. And you need to be very nimble in terms of reallocating your resources. So we think we're in peak, peak growth, peak inflation, and peak monet monetary stimulus for, for, for a period of time. If we get so that the infrastructure package that, that Biden is talking isn't big enough, isn't big enough. So, so China urbanization was 10 trillion. We think the Build Back Better is about 15 trillion. Uh, they need the Americans need at least five trillion to fix their infrastructure for the for the power grid. Okay. And so that's where when you read my stuff, I I I I I I segue into modern monetary theory, saying the only way you're going to be able to do this is like the 1945 to 1951 period where deficits didn't matter. But when we hear very important people like Larry Summers, like very well-connected people worried about inflation when the underlying fundamentals are really deflationary. Debt to GDP is higher. It's almost 300% in the United States. The US, so US has been growing at, at the natural rate of growth for the, our, what we call R star is about 1.7%. Mm -hmm. That started in about 1997 when debt got so large before it was 2.2%. How, where are all these people talking about inflation when you've got massive debt to GDP? But describe though, but describe though, Jim, why, why that inhibits GDP it, or inflation? It, like why, it why, why debt to GDP inhibits an inflation? The debt servicing, the debt servicing. At low rates? They would say inhibit. So we're going to get a little bit nuanced here. Yeah. Right? Okay. So money creation really comes out of lending from money centered banks. And I could show you a chart where, where lending divided by deposits, if I, and then I superimpose the velocity of money, they follow each other perfectly. So what really has not been happening for an extended period of time is because interest rates are so low, banks haven't been lending to Main Street. And, and what was very provocative was Mark Carney at the Bank of International Settlements last week, basically in a speech, threw the hammer down and he said, banks are a means to an end. They are not an end in themselves. So we're at a period of time. So in other words, he's trying to say that the banks need to lend. If they don't lend, you're, we're going to get central bank, we're going to get a central bank digital currency and the central banks are going to go around the money centered banks. You are suggesting that if the banks don't lend to Main Street, that the central bankers will create their own digital currency and go around the money center banks. That's I, can, I, I, I hear you in terms of the concept of that, but I just can't see it happening. I agree. But if you look at El Salvador, and now we're going off the reservation. Right? <laughs> oh, my God. If you look okay. at what they're doing with Bitcoin, making it legal tender, they've basically given everybody $50. They have directly deposited to the everybody's got a wallet. It's happening. Right. It's happening. And so the real concern, if we even go step back a little bit further, is the real the real bugaboo is is the rise of populism. OK. Right? And the way we get the rise of. Po and so if you go back to post World War Two, there were concerns about socialism and communism. But there was also a rise of populism because of the, the what happened with capitalism during the 1930s. And they, they, they were really, really, really concerned about it. They focused on getting money to Main Street. This is about generating economic growth. That's, so the Build Back Better Inclusive Economy is really getting money to Main Street, not Wall Street. And the problem with quantitative easing is it got money to the balance sheets of the banks and the banks didn't lend them and it went into financial assets. 
Think about what just happened with the stress test. What are banks going to do? They're going to pay down debt. They're going to buy back stock and they're going to increase dividends. They better start lending. And so, so Catherine, this is a narrative that, that although it may sound provocative, a Mm -hmm. lot of people are talking about this, right? We need to get growth happening on main street. And if the money centered banks aren't willing to lend to main street, Mm -hmm. then the only thing that can be left to do is for the central banks to, to replace them and start. Now we're talking down the decades, yeah, right? Down this the is road. a long, yeah. long, 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 long yeah. time. But I find it really startling when, 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 when Carney talks about it openly. Like, he yeah. does. I mean, Carney's new book on va- values. I mean, I was shocked when he talked, he had, he had a Zoom call to, this, to the uh, uh, Dallas Fed. And in there, he basically attacks... Um, he attacks the invisible hand or Adam Smith. And he basically invokes Adam Smith's first book, which is the theory on moral settlement, where he says, before we rely on the markets, we need to decide what we want as a society or a community. That's what we decide first. And then we let the markets do. Now, that to me and you, that for, that's us back at college talking about poly, poli sci. That's someone talking to the head of the St. Louis Fed saying, this is what we need to do. And he is the leader of the green movement. So, and possibly Catherine, if Uh we get a snap election in the fall, I would not be surprised if Mr. Carney is our next finance minister. Uh, Agreed. Um, But but let's describe um, in a little bit more easy to understand what his message actually means in terms of let's decide what we want society to look like. And then we let the markets. Right. Act. Did, what does that really mean? I mean, there, there's been articles written about his book, um, believing that it's on the different side to say it nicely. I mean, everybody has an opinion. It's great to have opinions, but what does that really mean in terms of what he suggested? Do we want uh, is 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 so the green is is the green economy important to us? Is and not so much for Canada, but thinking about the America uh, the states is is healthcare for all important? Yes. Is good education system important. Is a good infrastructure yeah. important? If these are the things that we are, uh, deem as important, then let's not start with the budget in mind. Let's start with the ends in mind. And, and Jamie Dimon even focuses and talks about this in his letter to the shareholders this year. So you got these powerful people talking about it. And so if that is what we're going to do, and then we let the markets determine what, you know, then how to allocate resources after the fact, then I've gotten to the point in my career where I'm not about to argue. Right. Right. I agree. I'm going, these important people are saying that take note. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that, that's a great point too. And I think many would say like, look, I mean, education um, isn't, uh, you know, distributed well, um, in terms of opportunity. So yeah, that sh- wouldn't that be a goal? If, I mean, if you ran a corporation, of course you'd say, what are our goals here? And then let's figure out the solution. So um, I, I think that's an interesting way to, to frame it in terms of, yep. um, you know, what Mark Carney is talking about. Um, but, and I hear you, right? Like, you know, what, from an investment perspective, so we'll get back to that. Um, what are the rules of the game? And therefore, now I know how I want to be positioned. That's what we're talking about, really, from an investment okay. perspective. Yes. Perfect. Yes. And so we suggest in a period of time, of ex- so every 80 years we go through this, right? Um, we have the rise of populism that drives the social change and, 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 and the social norms. We have the millennials, which are the, lar- are the largest cohort that is driving this, taking the passing the baton, the batons being passed by the boomers to the millennials. If this happens and we get the financing to do it, then the rules of the game have changed and we need to invest accordingly. And so to me, the biggest mistakes I've made in my investment career have not been able to recognize that the game has changed. 
yeah. and got muddled down in arguing all oh, the rules. No, no. If this is the game, uh -huh. the rules, and we have very, very important people talking about this, uh -huh. Janet Yellen, Mariel Draghi, Larry Summers, yada, yada, you know, on and on and on, then we need to to, to stand up and take notice as investors and what does this mean for our portfolios? Right, fair, fair point. So, and we're, that's what we're gonna do. Um, but I wanna go back, before we get in the build back better right. and, and green aspect, um, I, I wanna get your thoughts though, Larry Summers um, talking about inflation and you say no. Yep. What, why, how, how, is he, how, how is he not getting it right? In your mind, I think I think there's I think the larger question isn't it's not inflation it's modern monetary policy, MMT. Okay. Our, our, our modern monetary theory, where def, if you issue if you issue your own your own currency, deficits don't matter, and 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 so where this comes, I'm going to be a little bit more back to my, my economics professor is uh, uh, a career. Milton Friedman said that inflation is always a, a monetary phenomenon, right? That's what he said. It's always so, and I, and then you sit there and go, but he's using what's called the Fisher equation, but he's not stating the most important assumption that the velocity of money is constant. Well, the velocity of money is, it looks like the, it looks like the downside of a mountain. So if the velocity of money is declining rapidly, then money supply, the expansion of Fed's balance sheet, central bank's balance sheet, don't solve inflation. And here's the point. Wait, what do you mean by wait, what, do, what do you mean by velocity of money? How the the bank, the central, the central banks create out of thin, thin air a dollar, it gives it to a bank. How often is that dollar spent? Okay. Yeah. The turnover of money. Yeah, turnover of money. So as more money is being spent or created, is it being spent at a rapid, at an increasing rate okay. or a decrease? De because it's being spent at a decreasing rate, it's not money supply growth in itself is not inflationary. If it was, then don't you think Japan would not be in the fourth decade of a deflationary environment? Yeah, and that's just the basic, the basic, you know, this is you, so I don't. So my point is, I don't know why Mr. Summers is saying what he's saying. Right. I don't want to question him. But when he says that, mm -hmm. and if you have the status, then you have that president of the St. Louis Fed coming out on the Friday of quad witching which is the most volatile day of the year and comes out and says, no, 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 no. You guys have got it wrong. We're really hawkish. Catherine, you got to stand up and notice saying what the heck is going on. So we were talking about this since mid May in, in at, at, at Wellington about, you know, the pivot from early cycle to mid cycle to long duration. As when Bullard came on, I had a call and I said, you guys do not have time. You do not have time to, 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 to dilly dally. Interest rates are going down. They are going to fight inflation, even though it's transitory. You are forewarned. And look at the market right now. The 10 year is dropping every day. The 30 year in the States is below 2%. Yeah, I know. And this morning I was watching the screen and, you know, the U.S. 10 year yield went to 1.38. I don't know where it is at this current moment, but 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 Jim, explain what you mean in terms of you don't have time to dilly dally. Like, what, what are you talking about? So so the market, the market internals have changed. OK. From when you and I got into the business. OK, the mark, we have educated a generation or a couple of generations of people that are but basically investors that said buy ETFs very rarely does an active manager outperform and we've also watched look at the TD latest TD commercial on the website we will teach you options it's really easy the market is dominated by options in ETF it's not dated dominated by long only managers 
So an ETF, is it's a buy instantaneously or it is a sell instantaneously. And if you sit there and everybody thinks the same way and they all sell at the same time, there's nobody on the other side. Mm -hmm. And you get these elevator shafts like March, like the fall of 2018. It really started to kick in around 2014 when ETFs overlay options as well, when they started to dominate the flows of the market. So you don't have people sitting, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, this stock is down and I've got a bunch of cash and I'm going to start picking at this stock <laughs> because I like it on a value. They're not there anymore, Catherine. Yeah. They're not there anymore. So the dynamics, the internal dynamics of the market. So you can't be reactive. You have to be proactive in terms of positioning your portfolios. Mm -hmm. Right? You do. And, and so let, let's go back, though, to, you know, what happens um, in the U.S. And, and, you know, we're sitting here in Canada, but, but you know, we want to look at what's going on in the United States in terms of the trickle effect that that has on Canada. So um, depending on what the size is of the infrastructure bill in the United States, you're saying it's, it's way too small to make a dent in growth. But the Build Back Better, uh, depending on the size, might um, do just that might be large enough to, to really perhaps create growth. And if so, specifically in what areas, I mean, in some ways it's in areas that you might not think about like in certain commodities, is it not? That's the irony. That's why I wrote the piece on the commodity super cycle, because if we get the, the road to, G, to, to, to net zero is the irony is it's commodity intensive. That's the uh -huh. irony. Right. And so, and so that's why we wrote that piece. So copper, uh, lithium, oil, uh, natural gas, uranium, um, you know, we've got to get through this year, right? Because of the, the craziness of the, the V-shaped recovery and we got to get normalized. But once we do, if we come back, we're going to have a period of time. And this is what we say internally is you're going to have to have a portion of your portfolio for the commodities. And you're going to, and, and remember, the average PM has a lifespan of about eight years. The average portfolio manager? Yes. So what are you talking about? Like, no, no, think about this, Catherine. No, We've been in the business. Like, come on. Everybody I, wants to be in it for a long time. Why only eight years? You underperform. Okay. You're fired. Yeah. And we all say, yeah, 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 yeah. Just stick to your knitting. We love what you're doing. You underperform for three quarters, you get fired. And then very rarely what happens in our business is people don't want to restart their careers. And so you have a very, very small history of experience. So think about that. I'm talking to you about, I can talk to you about sitting there in 2001 and 2002 and 450 Park Avenue with five Canadians and 15 U.S. portfolio managers and Goldman Sachs walks in and pitches the brick trade. I can remember that trade. I can remember the Americans not knowing anything about energy. I can remember when there was no sell side coverage in energy, right? right? I can remember when I got my iPhone. I can remember when you sit, I, when I was on CNBC and I said, this is a shame. And, and Joe Kernan said, what? I go, I'm in the wealthiest city in the world and I can't get a cell cover. I can't get a cell. <laughs> this is a joke. Right. It, it and, might have been the studio. It could have right? just been the studio. No, I was on, I was walking up Lexington Avenue. And the point uh, I'm trying to make is, but then now, so what, you know, American Tower at $2, it's now you hear, oh, REITs, let's buy American Tower at $235. No one believed that this was going to be as big as it was. So here's the point you and yeah. I have lived this. We don't get a get out of jail free card, but those, those individuals that have only been in the business eight years, think about that. Mm -hmm. that means they weren't around for 2008. They yeah. weren't around for tapering. So right? how, do you, how do you turn that then into an opportunity, Jim? Like in terms of, you know, what, what, is, what, what do you observe, right? It's, it's a lot about, um, in my opinion, uh, observing and, and taking time to think uh, a lot of people don't set enough time aside to do that. And I was thinking about this uh, last night, actually, how many, not how many, but there's a few inordinately smart people who um, 
I won't mention names, but in conversations, you know, they're too busy during the week to read the Wall Street Journal, but they accumulate the five days and they sit down on Saturday. They do their one and a half hour run and then they read the Wall Street Journal. And and I I love that because, I, I, you know, even though it might not be the news of today, you can always learn things. And when you have the actual paper, you curate what you want to read yourself as opposed to being fed to you. And you can miss some really interesting aspects and stories. So um, I think that's just a smart thing to, to do and to think about. Um, but with all of our years, which is kind of what we're talking about, how do you make sure that you're observing and um, and making action on what you see and what you think? What do you see and think? So to your first, to your point is this is this, what I, I, tr I work very hard at trying to as simply as I possibly can explain very difficult things. Right. But I work six days a week. Right. It's a, this, just this people who think, if you think you can just tune in, right. There's a, there's an argument, there's an old saying, who's the dumb money. Right. Uh -huh. The dumb money are those that are buying oil right now, the oil stocks right now, right? Look at the contract curve, right? It's, it's over. You, we're going to get, we're going to get, so, so we're going to get shoulder seasons. It's going to be an Iran deal, right? And OPEC has to do, ha, has to come to an agreement. But so what I have done is I stopped arguing about things philosophically. Like, and uh -huh. I, I've dripped on you a couple of times about this. If Mark Carney says this, that's fine. I'm, I'm not going to argue. If, 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 if Larry Summers is basically saying inflation is important, you cannot do modern monetary theory, that to me suggests reactivity, right? They're going to be reactive. Write it down, right? If, you know, and it's just continual research. It's continual pulling back and building a context. Mm -hmm. and, and, and at the same point in time, recognizing the fact that in a lot of, in the evolutionary process, uh, it's not different. It's the, it rhymes a lot, but it's not different. So it's, you know, it's the millennials. Now we're talking about mem stocks in the millennials. That's no different than the baby boomers buying uh, mutual funds in the eighties. Oh, that's interesting. Right. I mean, I mean, look at the, you know, and, and so we talk about the fact that typically a struck we're in a structural or a secular bull market that will end when the millennials cease to have the dominant position in the market this is no different than the baby boomers this is no different than the silent generation this is no great difference in the greatest generation and when their influence stop peaks is when the valuation of the market peaks and when the secular bull market is over the last one we saw was when? 1999, 2000. That's when the baby boomers cease to have the, magnif the magnification of their effect. So it's the millennials. Now, what are the, the millennials vest differently than the baby boomers? And the baby boomers invested different than the silent generation. And so if you have that context and you just sit there and go, I'm not saying you have to buy a mem stock, right? I'm just saying... I get it, right? It's uh -huh. like stick.com in the 1990s, right? Go back and listen to, it's on YouTube, go back and listen to USA Today with Bryant Gumbel and Katie Carrick talking about the internet. Okay? <laughs> no, I and then I, I take my girls, my two team, my wife, my one that's 22, my one that's 70, I said, this is what they thought about when this, when you guys are walking around with this, they thought it was a fad. Wow. Right. And uh -huh. so to, for me, it's 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 the con and it's a lot of humility. It's it, I don't know everything. As I get older, it's I know a lot less. And I'm willing to say that. And I'm willing to uh -huh. say, Catherine, I don't know what uh -huh. President Biden is going to do. But right now, it sure doesn't look like we're coming with a multi trillion dollar green infrastructure project, which means the deflationary pressures and the deflationists, I call them, are going to have their day in the sun. Mm -hmm. and they're going to be right. So how do you want to, I mean, a couple of things, but I, I, I want to know how you want to be positioned then for a deflationary environment. But first, I want to go back to something that you're talking about as well as a commodity super cycle. And yet I think you believe that oil's peaked. But, um, you know, with all the lack of investment spending over the past number of years, 
I, I, I would think it has more legs. Oh, no. So, so, so let's separate tactical and, and, and long-term, right? Okay. So let's say they do, they do 96, they do not, uh, the world consumes 96 uh, million barrels a day, right? A boil. We're talking about 2% right now. Everybody's got 2 million barrels, 2 million barrels, right? That Iran, we cut a deal with Iran, that's done, right? We cut a deal with OPEC, we get more on. Now, but, but the point is, the point is, you know and I know that commodities before crypto came along, commodities were the most volatile asset class. Uh -huh. And that is not going away. So we're going to have the shoulder season, right? And all I am suggesting is that you're going to want to have a position in commodities over a five to 10 year period as we build back better green. And what you need to understand is that the market is going to be highly, highly volatile as commodities always are. But you're absolutely right. When you think about this, they're not going to, they are not, it'll be very interesting to see the religion the industry has and what the long-term effects of ESG investing are. Because with 14% free cash flow, I would suggest to you that senior management in a company like a CNQ is frothing at the mouth to increase CapEx because there's only so much debt they can pay down. There's only so much stock they can buy back. There's only so much they can increase the dividend. And you know as well as I do, living in Canada, growing up in this business in Canada, material or commodity guys and energy guys, they're deal junkies. And they love CapEx and they love takeovers. It will be very interesting to see what happens later on in the cycle if this religion holds. I don't, I don't know. But it's, 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 it remains to be seen. So when I say a pullback, you know, back to, back to $60. The, mm -hmm. the, the, strip, the strip is saying, the strip, I'm going to be, the strip is in backwardation. The strip is not saying that they believe the short-term energy price is at $75. You go out two years, it's back below 60. Yeah. Okay? So I'll, I'm, not, I'm not saying going back to 25 I am saying maybe we get a pullback in the shoulder season back to the low 60s, high 50s, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And then we get the greenback. But if we get the idea that we're actually going to have a cyclical growth period, like 45 to 51, then you want to buy them, right? You want to just, you want to have it. You want to have it. It's, it'll be great. But, you know, it's, 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 it's a volatile space. Mm -hmm. um, Jim, describe it. 45 to 51, 1945 to 1951 uh, looked like? So first, first the, the Federal Reserve and the Treasury uh, worked together in tandem. And okay. the, the Treasury, and the reason that I picked this period is because Ben Bernanke talked about this period, right? And Larry Summers has talked about this. So, so all the cool kids have talked about this period, right? That's right. And so the, 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 they couldn't raise interest rates because the amount of debt that existed. Um, they needed to grow. So we had the GI Bill. They had to educate all the, you know, the structural unemployment that existed in the 1930s came from the agricultural sector being too big. So you had to re-educate the GIs coming back. People forget that Henry Wallace, who was FDR's vice uh, president, was more popular than FDR, was taken out in the 1944 Democratic convention and replaced by Henry Truman uh, that he, no one knew about him, right? And, and, and FDR didn't really have a relationship with him. And Henry Wallace was a, was a populist, right? Was, was wanted to, wanted to uh, 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 work with China and Russia, right? Uh, there was a massive, massive uh, uh, a policy mistake with the, the allies assuming that China was going to go de democratic and not communist, right? Think about how the world would have looked if China was, you know, in democratic coming out of World War II. And so, and they, so they had a massive infrastructure spend. They increased debt. They increased the size of the balance sheet. The Fed didn't raise rates. They jawboned. Think of Larry mm. Summers. Yeah. You gotta think of... Uh, of the head of the St. Louis Fed and the Dallas Fed to keep interest rates down because they couldn't raise. And in 1951, what was very interesting is what happened was that relationship had to be broken 
because two things happened in 51. One was we had two massive geopolitical events. One was uh, China getting into the Korean War. And two months later, Russia or the USSR marching into Berlin. And people thought we were going to go into World War III and we had massive hoarding. That's what started hyperinflation and the inflationary pressures. And that uh, in 51, an agreement was made between the Fed and the Treasury to separate and so that the Fed could become independent and raise interest rates. That's, that is the, that is, that, that's the whole building. So, so let's forget about, let's for, take out agriculture. I think it's the service sector, right? We, you know, and, and, and we need to educate people. Uh, it's the green back better, build back better, right? And it may not be socialism and communism, but there's populism. We need to get these people back to work. Mega, Catherine, there are 75 million people in the United States that think that, that the election was stolen. And don't freak out. I know people that are freaking out. Oh my God, <laughs> he loves Trump. No, this just because CNN doesn't cover it doesn't mean it's happening. Phone your friends in the United States, right? I don't know whether Trump is going to get back in, but what we need to do is we need to get these people back to work. And that's where Powell comes in and says, and, and Lagarde comes in and says, we need to basically have a monetary policy and a fiscal policy that helps Main Street. It's income inequality, right? So that's where, so that's, that's, that's where we're at. So that's, you know, Ray Dalio says it, right? They yeah. can't raise interest rates. They can't. It's going to kill us. They can't let inflation get out of control. I understand. I get it. So going back to what, how do I build it? I said, okay, this is exactly what Bernanke talked about in his speeches to the Bank of Japan, right? This is exact. This is it. This is the playbook. So what do we do? Yeah. What do uh, we do? Well, we sit back and when we sit there and talk, have people really talking about tapering, when we really don't know what the new world looks like. Catherine, I don't know what the post-COVID world looks like. 70% uh -huh. of our economy is service. What if only 65% comes back? Okay, that's a 5% hole that has to be filled. I don't know yeah. what this thing looks like, but yet they're talking about tapering. Don't argue, get positioned, long duration. That's by the long end of the yield curve, by the 30-year, the 20-year, the 10-year, buy tech, Position your portfolio for slowing economy, declining interest rates, and uh, and 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 a, and a pullback on monetary stimulus in the, in you know over the next year to eighteen months. Mm -hmm. That's the message. Okay, you know, and and back to your point about the service economy and and you know people we know who have the salons, the boutiques, etc. And, and it has been so devastating for, for so many people and they won't be able to get back. Um, and I do think that that is going to be a hole or a gap, um, you know, and you have to kind of th think about what kind of impact that will have on, on the economy, because, you know, we talk a lot about the need to uh, for, for skill enhancement um, and, and also supporting businesses that have, have gone under. And it takes time. It takes years. And depending on where you're at in your life stage and cycle and marriage and young kids or not or what have you, it's, it's, it's definitely going to be a lot, a lot for a certain group of people. It's going to be very, very tough. And so to, to, to the point about fiscal stimulus and the government stepping in, there will be that need, Jim. That's and the way you rationalize it is you got to say deficits don't matter until they do, right? The deficits are going to matter, right? But to your point, right? To you, 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 we've nailed. So, so we're, we're, you're right on. You're right on. So, so we've got to come up with a GI bill. We've got what are we gonna? What is so so so? Then you say, uh, you know, if if you and I are managing money together, I go. So what if, why is Summers and Kaplan, all these guys talking about inflation, 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 turn on the business news channel. All we hear is inflation, 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 reflation. Like what's going on, right? They, they can't, right? And yet to think that it's not transitory, to me, nobody has given me any data 
proven anything to say any otherwise. I mean, eventually the supply chains are going to normalize, mm -hmm. right? Eventually, price the goods from China, uh, from Asia are going to get into North America, and prices are going to go back down eventually, right? And so, and so, I'm with you. But so so but but when I hear the drumbeat of of making a tapering decision before we know what the new world looks like, that is a time to become cautious. And I just don't see what the rest of the, uh, I'll call it the consent, because the, 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 the deflation or disinflation is a non-consensus trade right now. You know, and so- It's becoming but, more consensus. Oh, as you, whoa, as you look at the 10 year and the 20, yeah, it is. Yeah. And people, <laughs> And people, yeah, because yeah, and, and so, and so for us is is I don't, I don't know, Catherine. I I don't, you know, and we got a midterm election in twenty two. So what does this all look like, right? Yeah, I I don't yeah. know. I don't know. So yeah, yeah. But, but we but in December of this year of last year we wrote a a, tw a twenty one forecast where we said forty five hundred for the S and P by the end of the year, right. We're 43 and a half, right? The, the very cold limb that I was out on when I was high on the street, globally, nobody, none of Brian Belsky, Tom Lee, let's go through all the guys that are coming. They're all like, hey, what's going on, right? In December, I was there saying, well, this is, but this is 2010, it's a classic. So now what happens? I'm 150 points to my, yeah. you know, so, so what does that mean? I, and I'm sure talking to my friends in the United States, I'm not the only one positioned like this. So if you are positioned running, long. If well, you, right. If you, you are, if you are running a big friggin' hedge fund. Okay. And you are way above your high water mark halfway through the year. Catherine, what are you going to do? You're going to take some profits. You're going to shut it down. Or you have a big family office. You're going to shut it down. And I suggest to you that's what's happening. Okay. Um, Jim, I, I want to give you um, the opportunity to just say what you're doing right now. because And, and also because whenever I start these um, uh, interviews on my YouTube channel, I always say, this is not investment advice. <laughs> It's informational and entertainment only, but, but, you know, people should know that you are your, your position. Um, and, and also that, you know, when you're saying go long, the long bond or whatever, not investment advice. I mean, you've got, you've got a team of people that they, they can reach out to at, right. at your firm. Sure. Sure. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm the chief market strategist at Wellington Altus, right? You need to talk to an investment professional before you do anything that I talked about. And we are, what we're doing at Wellington Altus is we're going to build, and we are in the process of building the largest independent platform that provides world-class intellectual property, thought leadership in a conservative risk adverse way. And we think that right now, or we know that it's ripe for Canada to have an alternative to the other fine vendors that exist in this country that provide investment advice. And so because I'm at Wellington, I can be a little bit more provocative like in, during our conversation <laughs> as opposed to if I worked for a large traditional financial institution, which are wonderful institutions that are very smart and yeah. very conscientious. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, that's great. Okay. So thank you for that. And Jim, let's just kind of wrap it here in terms of um, bottom line, as we think about the next 12 months in the market, what do people need to take away? Bottom line. We need to take away. Is there going to be significant fiscal policy help to counteract the large deflationary forces that exist and have been amplified in the economy. And if it doesn't happen, 
that it's much smaller than expected. You must ex position your portfolios for slower growth in declining prices. If we get a big push from the government, Canada and the United States and Europe to build back better, and we have a big fiscal policy response, then you need to get much more cyclical in your allocation. Moving forward, interest rates will start to tick higher. You know, banks will look very attractive. Commodities will look very attractive. And so what we need to do right now is you need to take a pause. If you have a lot of money that you've made a lot of money, you need to take some money off the table and you need to basically get some context and position. Now, if you don't agree with this view, that's fair, right? That's what makes the market. Yeah. Um, I, I just, to me, it's when the 10 year has peaked at the end of March, when the Dow transports peaked at the end of March, when small caps underperformed since the end of March, when value has started to substantially outperform, um, I think we're in a position where we need to, to show some prudence and, some, and, and, and recognize that maybe the cyclical uh, dispo exposure may need to be ratcheted back a touch. Okay. All right, Jim, we will um, we'll leave it there. Great advice, great conversation. Always appreciate your views. It's amazing. And you can be provocative, which you always were and are. So. <laughs> right? Yes. I mean, that's the, uh, we want to be able to provide independent thought. Yeah. Right. Uh, and, uh, yeah. And, and, and I think the other thing is, just, this is just from reading, you know, I mean, has anybody talked about Mark Carney's speech at the Bank of International Settlements? It was profound. It was, you know, you, it was 28, but you have to read it, right? Or watch his speech to the Dallas Fed. It's shocking. I have my phone, my phone over here lights up going, did you hear what he said? <laughs> it, was, it was the same, it's the same people that said, did you see Powell invoke section 13.3? They're going to drop the neutron bomb. That's what every, that's what the smart money does. As opposed to, you know, be very, very short term in their focus. Right. All right. Well said. We'll leave it there, Jim. Great to see you. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Okay.